Hi, I'm Ann Churchland from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York, and my lab studies decision making, and especially the neural basis of decision making. And today I'm going to tell you about a question that we think a lot about in my lab, which is how do brains decide? So for us, a decision is a commitment to one out of a number of alternatives. So consider this cyclist here. She's riding along, and she has to make a decision about which of the two paths to take, to the right or to the left. And on one of the paths, there's a dog. And this is a decision uh, under somewhat, uncer somewhat uncertain conditions. For instance, the dog could be friendly, a nice puppy that would be fun to encounter, or it could be kind of an angry dog that she would want to avoid. So the sensory signals from the dog come into her brain. And these include visual signals, like is the dog, are the dog's teeth showing, is it wagging its tail, and also auditory signals, like is the dog barking or maybe panting happily. And her brain will put together these very different sources of information and make a decision about which path is the right one to take. Decisions uh, of the sort we study in the lab and also in real life vary naturally in their complexity, from very simple sensory motor loops that we wouldn't really consider a decision at all, like when the doctor hits your knee at the doctor's office and you have a knee-jerk reflex. That's not really, a, it's so simple as to not really be a decision, as to very complex sensory motor loops, like deciding what kind of car to buy or what uh, profession to pursue. These are decisions that integrate many sources of information, really quite different sources of information information sometimes, and our brains put those sources of information together and ultimately uh, lead us to make a decision and sometimes to take action to carry through that decision. So why should we study decision making? Why do we care about it and why do we study it in the lab? Well, there's a few reasons, and, and one of them is that it's a really interesting question from a basic science point of view, in the sense that it can tell us about how our brains take very different sources of information and put them together to figure out what to do. There's a lot of other reasons to study decision-making as well. We think it might give us insight into really important clinical problems that are not fully understood. One example is that it might help us make better treatments for addiction. If you think about it, being an addict involves a fundamental decision-making disorder in the sense that the decision to keep taking a substance is often very much not in the person's interest and they don't want to make that decision and yet sometimes can't help but make it anyway. And if we understood decision-making circuits and how they go wrong in situations like addiction, we might be able to come up with better treatments compared to the ones that we have today. We also might be able to understand, to better understand disorders like autism, schizophrenia, and attention deficit hyperactive disorder, or ADHD. And the reason that decision-making is relevant for this um, has to do with the kinds of decisions that, that certain labs like mine study, where we're interested in perceptual inputs and how these lead to, act, lead to action. And so what it means to make a perceptual decision is to take that sensory signal, visual or auditory, and to make sense of it, to interpret it, and to help the brain figure out what to do. And that process of interpreting sensory information can be quite different in patients who have autism and schizophrenia. And similarly for ADHD, and also in those patients, there are differences on the action side as well. For instance, they tend to have many more motor outputs um, uh, than, than, typically, um, than typical subjects. Uh, and finally, understanding decision-making might help us develop more effective consequences for bad decisions. Sometimes people make bad decisions. They decide to steal something or they decide to drive um, when they're intoxicated. And there are some situations where it's very cut and dry and the consequences are clear. But there are other gray areas where we aren't always, aren't always sure whether the person should be held responsible or not. And understanding how brains make decisions and how sometimes brains make really bad decisions will help us interpret those gray area situations and figure out what to do uh, to prevent those decisions from happening in the future. So how do we study decision making in the laboratory? Well, we have a, a bunch of tricks up our sleeves. And, and one of the things that I think has made this field uh, successful is that we're able to study decision making uh, in many different species. So naturally, we're interested ultimately in how humans make decisions. So there are a number of labs, my own included, where we study human behavior. So we have humans to whom we show perceptual stimuli, often visual stimuli on a monitor like you see here, maybe auditory stimuli that we play over a speaker, and they report their decisions to us, that is what they see or hear, by using a key press on a computer. 
Uh, a second way that we might study decision making in the laboratory is to study decisions in animals. Uh, and the first example of two that I'll show you here is a non human primate. This is a monkey who's making a decision. And monkeys have really great visual systems that are quite similar to the human visual system. And so we can learn a lot about uh, human visual decision making using this particular animal as a model system. So, for instance, we might uh, teach a monkey to, to fixate on a point on a screen and then. Uh, show it two potential decision, decision outcomes that in a moment it will use to report its choice, and then give it some kind of interesting, maybe difficult to judge sensory stimulus. What you see here are, are randomly moving dots, and some of them are moving together in the same direction, but most of them are moving randomly. And the job of this animal is to make a decision about this uncertain stimulus, whether it's moving to the right or to the left, and to report that decision by making a rapid ballistic eye movement called a saccade, and monkeys make them and you and I make them too, uh, to the target corresponding to the direction of motion in the stimulus. And this is a useful way to study decision making because we can study the same decisions in non human primates and also in humans. And we can see the degree to which they measure up. How similar are they? Where are their differences? Is there evidence that the same computations are at work in these two very different species? And in fact, we can even take it a step further and study decision making not only in primates, non human or human, but also in rodents, in rats or mice. In this particular setup that you see here, the animal um, can interact uh, with these three circles that we call ports, and each of them is spanned by a small infrared beam. And the animal learns to break that beam with its snout and to communicate things to us, like it's ready to start a decision making trial, or it's made a judgment about the stimulus, and it's going to report that by going to the left or the right. And these are naturally kind of abstract from the point of view of the animal, but as they were for the monkey as well. The animal has to learn that, for example, going to that right port will communicate a rightwards decision about some sort of a sensory stimulus. But animals are pretty good at figuring that out. And when we put them uh, in a scenario where they can interact with these ports, it kind of taps into their natural sense of foraging, in the sense that they go into the environment, figure out what's what, kind of play around with the ports and see what happens when they do different things. And because they get rewarded by making correct decisions, they eventually learn uh, what, what we are hoping um, that, that they will about the structure of the experiment and how they can report their perceptual decisions to us. I'll show you now a movie. Uh, this is a, a movie of a rat. This is seen from above, so you're looking down on the same kind of scenario I showed you in the previous slide. So there are three choice ports, and there's a rat in the middle. And the one at the center is the place where the, the rat will put his nose to tell us he's ready to start a decision making trial. So he puts his uh, snout in and breaks that beam. And then after that, he's presented with a stimuli. And these might be visual or auditory, or maybe both together. We call that multisensory. And then after a second long period where he patiently waits, he knows it's time to report his choice. And he'll go to the left port if it's a, a, a low rate stimulus flickering or clicking at a low rate. And he'll go to the right if it's a high rate stimulus flickering or clicking at a high rate. And as I said a moment ago, this is, of course, very abstract. There's nothing about a high rate stimulus that would tell an animal to go to the right. Uh, but the animals have a lot of experience with this setup and with this behavior. And they learn fairly rapidly that certain stimuli mean they should do one thing, and other stimuli mean that they should do the other thing. Now, that's a visual stimulus. And he goes to the right. He's harvesting a reward. That was auditory, went to the right. Multisensory. And you get the idea. And you can see that the animals are, pre he's really quite engaged in this task uh, and is willing, in fact, most animals to do about a thousand repetitions um, of uh, these decisions in a single session. And one of the things that's useful about this approach is that we have a real gauge on how the animal's feeling. Because if it gets uh, annoyed or frustrated or even bored, it'll stop doing the behavior. So we know that the animal's engaged because it's the animal itself that decides to initiate the trial each time by putting its nose into that little center port.
So for us, it, it seems like maybe they think of this kind of the way we would think of as a video game. So they go in, there's sort of stimuli happening, you have to figure out what to do. If you get it right, you get a little reward. Um, and, and for that reason, uh, they are quite engaged and are willing to make many decisions. And from an experimental point of view, this is really useful um, because we can get a sense of, of what happens on average. We can look at variability across decisions. It's a really powerful tool for understanding how, uh, how uh, animals take in sensory information and use it to make a decision about what to do. So what have we learned so far about studying decision making by measuring behavior? The first thing that we've learned is that subjects put together information in a pretty smart way. So for instance, if we give animals not just visual or just auditory, but both together, we find that they're able to make more accurate decisions than if they have either stimulus just by itself. And even better, it isn't just that they put auditory and visual together kind of willy-nilly. They do it in a very clever or, or judicious way, you might say. So for instance, if we make one of the modalities less reliable than the other, so it's not too informative about the decision, they don't ignore it. They're not going to throw information away, but they assign it much less weight when they put the two together. So you can kind of think of this, uh, an example is you can imagine that you're at the airport and your, your cell phone is telling you, oh yeah, you've got to go to gate 7, but then the person next to you in security says, oh no, your flight's leaving from gate 20. Well, those are two pieces of information about the same decision, and as the decision maker, you have to figure out which of those is more reliable and weight that more heavily. And most people uh, would probably go with the cell phone, although, I don't know, maybe the person in line seems reliable. Um, but, but really, it's the same kind of decision that we study in the lab. We give them multiple pieces of information, sometimes conflicting, uh, and they have to um, judge, as we do, which one is more certain. Uh, and so this is a schematic showing a, a human encountering a multisensory stimulus, a mosquito, um, which of course we can both hear and see. Um, so to give you a little more uh, detail about how the animals make these decisions, this is a schematic of a rat making a low rate decision. So you can see there are auditory and visual cues um, that are both low rate, so he goes to the left to be rewarded. And this is a high rate decision uh, where he goes to the right. And to, to be more concrete about what I said a moment ago, they make more correct choices when they have information from both audition and vision together. So once we realized this, once we uh, noticed that they did better, we wanted to know if they were statistically optimal in the sense that they used information just exactly the way they should from uh, the point of view of maximum likelihood combining of information. So to be really concrete, um, what we are hoping that they will do is estimate some quantity. We call that R hat. And they might sometimes be able to estimate uh, R hat, R stands for rate, um, having both auditory and visual cues. That's why we call it RAV. And so the statistically optimal solution is this. You take the auditory rate by itself, that's RA, and you weight it by its uncertainty. And then the visual cue, RV, and weight it by its uncertainty. So remember, this is just like the airport, right? You have two pieces of information. In the airport scenario, it was your cell phone and the guy next to you in security. And here the rats have two sources of information. They have the auditory information and the visual information, and they have to figure out how to combine them uh, to, uh, to, to have the best decision that they can. And I should say, when I first set out to test this, it was known, had been known for a while that humans do make statistically optimal decisions when they combine auditory and visual information. But when we set out to show this in, in rats, to test whether rats could do it, people thought this was a crazy idea. They're like, okay, come on, statistically optimal cue combination in a rat? No way. But, you know, we were daunted and, and we figured that many organisms experience the world in, in similar ways. And so it might be that the computations that define the human brain are shared by animals as well. So the way that we showed this was by presenting auditory and visual cues that were in conflict. And then based on that, we can use a mathematical, uh, mathematical model um, to tell us exactly what the animals would do if they were combining the information optimally. That's called the predicted visual cue weight. And that's the quantity on the horizontal axis that you see there. And then on the vertical axis, this is what they actually did do. This is what we measured in the laboratory. And the extent to which the points lie on that black dotted line that you see there, that means that the rat or the human is a statistically optimal decision maker. And in fact, we found that our rats, just like our human subjects, were really right on the money. So when we made vision unreliable, they didn't ignore it, but they let it influence the decision a little bit less. 
and the same uh, and the same was true for the auditory. So this to me was really exciting, and it suggested that even though rats and humans are really pretty different, you know, at least seemingly pretty different, that we share a lot of neural computations that help us make sense of the world and put different pieces of information together. Another thing that we've learned about decision-making through just the measure of behavior is that rodents, monkeys, and humans have a lot in common about the way that they make decisions. So let me be really concrete about that and delve into the details a little bit and tell you about an analysis that we do that allows us to really put the humans and the rats head-to-head. -head. So remember I told you earlier, and you saw in the movie, that the information the subjects use for their decision arrives over time. So there's a series of clicks, click, 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 or a series of flashes, sometimes both together. And subjects can really use that time, that, that information as it arrives over time, any way they want. So for instance, they might make a snap judgment and make their decision right away after just the first three clicks and then ignore the rest of the stimulus while they're sitting there for, for a thousand milliseconds a second. Um, another thing they might do is procrastinate. They might sit there relaxing and then at the very end of the stimulus tune in uh, and make their decision based on what happened at the very end of the stimulus. And without going into too much detail, we have an analysis that we do that allows us to determine the extent to which each subject, human or rat, um, uh, how they use time. So the quantity that you see on the vertical axis is the influence on the eventual decision of a particular moment in time. And on the horizontal axis, this is time relative to the decision. So this tells us whether subjects make snap judgments, procrastinators, or whether they do the right thing, which is to use information that's presented throughout the second long period. And what we can tell from looking at a plot like this is that these lines are fairly flat and that they're above zero throughout the entire trial. And that means that these human subjects are using all of the information uh, that's being presented, uh, and they're using it all in a fairly equal way. So now we can say, well, what do the rats do? Do they look like the humans? Or are they, you know, do they tend to procrastinate or make snap judgments? So here's the rat data underneath. And you can see that the rat data and the human data are really quite similar. Just like the humans, the green and the blue curves are above zero for out the entire trial, and they're fairly flat. Although you'll notice at the very end, uh, the very end over here, um, that these traces do go fairly close to the zero for the rats only and not the humans. And what that means is at the end of the trial, when they're close to making their decisions, the rats aren't really paying attention to the stimulus anymore. And we realize that the reason for this difference is that the rats at this point are preparing a pretty big movement that they have to make, coming out of the center port, going off to the other port to report their decision, uh, and that they need some time to plan that full body movement. And the humans, it's quite different. All they have to do, they have their two fingers on a keyboard, and they just have to press this finger or that finger. It's not a very big movement to plan. And so they really can use information at the very end of the trial a little bit better uh, than the rats. The rats are also working for a water reward, and they're excited to get that reward at the end of the trial. So that probably explains a slight difference as well. So we wouldn't say that these two species are exactly the same, but they have really very small differences. And those differences are probably not because one species is a human and one is a rat, um, but more differences in the way, just given the constraints of the laboratory and how they actually respond their decisions. So this, to me, um, was really exciting and suggested, again, that there are some common computations that are shared across many species for how we take in sensory signals and put them together to make a decision. Okay, so finally, um, uh, I've told you so far two things we've learned about decision-making through behavior. And the last one is we found that despite what I just told you, despite being often very clever decision-makers in how they combine information, both species sometimes have lapses in judgment. And this may not come as a surprise, because maybe we all know that sometimes we make bad decisions. So how do we study this in the laboratory? So one way that we visualize decision-making data is that we plot the proportion of times that the animal makes a particular choice, say a right choice. Remember, that's often a high-rate choice for us. And then we look at that as a function of the stimulus intensity. How high-rate is the stimulus, or how low-rate is the stimulus? Uh, and this is what we call a psychometric function. This tells us the relationship between the proportion of a certain kind of choice and the intensity of the stimulus that the, that the subject sees. And what's important to note about this function here is that 
it doesn't quite go to one. So even when the stimulus is really easy, there's a couple of, of decisions that the animal gets wrong. And this seems mysterious, because this is a really easy stimulus. It's super high rate. It's pretty obvious that it's not a low rate stimulus. And yet, occasionally, the animals make mistakes. And here's a, a, a slightly different stimulus condition that's a bit more uncertain for the animal. We make the stimulus a bit less reliable. Um, and we find, whoops, that actually the proportion of, of correct choices, of right choices, is, is again, there's, there's even more mistakes than we saw um, uh, with, with the red trace. So this suggests that even when the stimulus is really easy, that sometimes animals make mistakes. And one thing we've come to understand about these lapses in decision making is that sometimes they really are lapses. Like maybe the animal closes its eyes for a moment or is thinking about something else. But oftentimes it's something else. The reason they make these bad decisions with really easy stimuli is because they're exploring the environments a little bit. They're wondering whether their understanding of what they're supposed to do, say go right for high rate, is really their, the correct understanding of their environment. And sometimes they sort of test the environment and try out a different decision to see what happens. And in a sense, this is frustrating. They shouldn't really do it. It means they get fewer rewards on our particular behavior. But you can imagine that in the real world, this is a, a smart strategy. You always want to trade off the degree to which you're exploiting an environment. That is, I understand how this works. I'm going to get as much reward as I can. And the extent to which you're exploring an environment, saying, well, I think I know how this works. I'm not totally sure. Maybe I'll try something different and see what happens. And this explore-exploit trade-off is something that humans are known to do. And we think that animals are really doing the same thing. And this is why sometimes they have lapses in decision-making, even when the stimulus is really easy and it's really obvious what to do. All right, so I've told you so far about decision-making behavior. And we believe we've learned a lot about the underlying neural mechanisms just by studying behavior. But we can learn more if we go in and actually look inside the brain and really see um, what is happening inside the brain. And fortunately, in the field of systems neuroscience, we're really at a good moment in terms of having many, many options um, for how to both measure activity and also manipulate neural activity. And this means that as animals are making decisions, we can understand what's happening to the neurons in their brain as they are making those decisions. And we can start to have a much deeper understanding of what goes on in the brain when we are deciding what to do. So I'll tell you about three of those methods for measuring neural activity now. Um, so the first one is that we can measure electrical signals in neurons. So the neurons in your brain, they communicate with each other with electrical signals called action potentials. And it's possible to measure these um, with just simple electrodes that pick up electrical activity. And this is a classic technique that has been around for a long time, was developed uh, almost 100 years ago at this point. Um, is nevertheless still very productive and still really in development as we learn to be able to record from not just one or two neurons at a time, but even using new technology today to record from hundreds of neurons at a time. And measuring these neural signals can give us a window on what's happening in the brain. I'm going to show you uh, data now from an actual neuron recorded in a decision-making area in the primate brain by uh, Mike Shadlin and Tim Hanks. So neurons in this part of the brain have what's called a response field. And that means that if you're planning an eye movement there if, to a target, that uh, the neuron will fire in advance of that eye movement. So for example, if by contrast, if the target is over here, the neuron won't fire because that isn't in the neuron's response field. In the movie that I'm going to show you, the first one, there is a target in the response field. And the job of the monkey is to look at that central white dot in the center. Uh, and then the target's going to extinguish. So the monkey has to remember where that target was. And you're going to want to listen to what happens as the monkey's um, planning a, tar a saccade to the remembered location. And eventually, the white light will extinguish. And that will mean that the monkey is allowed to make a saccade to the remembered location of the target. And you'll see a little white dot moving around. Uh, and that's actually the monkey's measured eye position, which we're able to see on a millisecond time scale. So you can hear the neurons. Each time you hear a little popping sound, that's the actual firing of a single neuron in a primate decision-making area. So what I hope you heard is that after that red target disappeared, there's really nothing in the monkey's response field. But the remembered location of the target is what drives that neuron to fire. Now let's see what happens when he makes a saccade outside the response field.
I hope you can see that the neuron went silent during that second memory period because the remembered location was no longer in the animal's response field. So neurons like these are interesting and they, in the sense that they show us activity that isn't necessarily related to incoming sensory signals and isn't exactly only related to a movement, but has to do with something in between a sensation and action and maybe reflecting computations that intervene between those incoming sensory signals and the outgoing actions. So electrophysiology um, continues to be a really important way of understanding neural activity and is used in in many different species and is starting to help us understand critical questions about how decision-making works. Um, A second method that we use is called imaging. And uh, in imaging, we can again measure the responses of one neuron at a time. But this time, uh, we're able to do that by using a camera to, uh, to measure optical signals from the neurons. And we do that by uh, using transgenic tools to have a, what's called a calcium indicator that allows um, the neuron to emit um, light when it's firing. And this is something that we can capture with a camera, in this case, um, a two-photon microscope. So this is a, a schematic of a mouse who's involved in a decision-making experiment. It's pretty similar to what I showed you with the rat, except instead of poking its snout into the choice ports, uh, instead of those three choice ports, it has three lick spouts instead. But pretty similar, it initiates a trial with the center one and then makes left and right licking movements to report a choice. And using our two-photon microscope, we're able to measure neural activity as the animal is encountering a sensory stimulus figuring what to, out what to do, and eventually reporting an action. And this method is very complementary to electrophysiology in the sense that we can use genetic tools to not only image neural activity of all the neurons, but also to label specific subpopulations of neurons. For instance, suppose we want to know what inhibitory neurons do in the brain. These are neurons that shut other neurons down. Well, we can use transgenic tools to label those inhibitory neurons and see what, how they respond during decision-making. And inhibitory neurons have been a very important component of many theoretical models of decision-making. And so understanding what they do is really critical to understanding the mechanisms more generally. So being able to image neural activity, which is a much newer technique than electrophysiology, has been very helpful in understanding what the brain does during decision-making and also distinguishing candidate decision-making models, many of which have really been around for a long time. So the final method that I'll tell you about um, uh, is imaging neural activity across the whole brain. So both of the techniques that I just showed you, electrophysiology and two-photon imaging, um, are their important techniques, but they really allow us to look at a very small area in the brain. So we can see what single neurons do, and that's a big win, but we only see single neurons in one very small place in the brain. And in complex behaviors like decision-making, many, many neural structures are recruited. And so being able to see neural activity across the whole brain, or across the whole dorsal cortex, as I'll show you in a moment, this is very helpful in terms of telling us how many, how multiple areas work together to support decision-making. So this method, again, takes advantage of the calcium indicators that I told you about with the imaging. The upshot of these calcium indicators is that when the neuron fires, it emits light, and so we can see that light with the camera. But this time, instead of zooming in on single neurons, we zoom out and get a bird's eye view um, of the entire dorsal cortex. So I'm going to show you now a movie that's going to show you what the whole brain, whole dorsal cortex is doing as animals are are making visual decisions. So this is a behavior similar to the one I've talked to you about previously. In this case, there are uh, visual stimuli that appear on the left or the right, and the mouse has to make a judgment. So this is a top-down, you're looking at the top from the top at a mouse brain, and the top part of the image um, is the front of the brain. So there's two circles at the top there. Um, That's the olfactory bulb, which is involved in smelling. And down here at the back of the brain, um, you can see primary visual cortex. The eyes are at the front, but the part of the brain that controls vision is at the very back. So this is an animal that's making visual decisions. So at one point, you'll see the back of the brain light up. And uh, what I hope you'll get from this movie is that there's really a lot going on, not just in the visual areas, but all over. So the trial starts off with a baseline period when the animal's just waiting. And then it grabs handles to initiate a trial. Stimulus comes on. You can see the bottom. That's the visual cortex lighting up. And the animal has to wait. It knows what it's going to do. It's going to report its decision. 
And then finally, it reports its decision by making a licking movement. And you can see that, especially towards the end of the, of the trial, that the whole brain is really engaged, that even this relatively simple decision involves many, many neural structures that work together in complex ways to support the animal's ability to take in a sensory stimulus and use it to make a decision about what to do. So what have we learned about decision-making uh, through measuring neural activity? We have a lot of ways of seeing what's happening in the brain while animals are deciding. What did we learn? So first of all, we learned that many brain areas spanning much of cortex and also many subcortical regions, those are the ones that are deeper in the brain, they're engaged during decision-making. And this might be helpful in understanding why decision-making can be vulnerable, like in some of the disorders I talked about at the, at the beginning, like in schizophrenia, addiction, ADHD, uh, autism spectrum disorder, and so on. If decisions require the coordinated effort of many, many brain structures, you could imagine that, that disrupting any one of those structures could change the way that decisions unfold uh, in a very dramatic way. So this research underscores the need um, to, to uh, better understand what happens in those disorders and where in the brain um, things have changed. We've also found that neurons in these structures reflect both sensory signals, those are the incoming visual or perhaps auditory signals that tell the animal what to do, but also internal variables. So it, we can't think of a decision as just sort of a stimulus response loop. There's always a lot that's happening in your brain when the sensory signals come in. Uh, in, in the case of a human making a decision about, say, what car to buy, maybe you're biased uh, towards certain kinds of cars because your dad had that car. Or, um, and so the sensory information interacts with that internal signal. Well, that's the same thing uh, with the animals and with the neural activity that we record. The neurons reflect the incoming visual signals, but also the animal's bias, uh, superstitions that the animal might have, such as a tendency to alternate left and right choices. And so if we really want to understand decision-making, we have to remember that it's not just stimulus in, action out. It's that the stimulus comes in and interacts with a whole host um, of ongoing internal variables, the, the combination of which lead to, uh, lead to action. And finally, uh, that the animal's current behavioral state affects both neural activity and behavior enormously. So in recent years, we've come to appreciate that, that each decision is not the same as the next decision or the one that came before it. That we have a particular state that our brains are in that affects very much how our neurons respond and, how, uh, and what we eventually do. And we sometimes are in what you might call kind of up states, um, where our neurons are very active. Uh, other times we're in down states, where the overall activity is lower. Uh, and the, the internal state, whether it's up or down, just to give an example, has a big impact on how those incoming sensory signals are used by the brain. So we have to remember that we have internal states that are changing all the time and are going to have a big impact uh, on, our, on our neurons, our neural activity, and ultimately what we decide to do. So you might wonder, you know, these decisions are interesting, but are they, are they really like what, what animals do in the wild? Are they maybe too artificial? And just to make that point really clearly, remember that we study animals that are, that are reporting choices by interacting with choice ports. But of course, in, the re in real life, things are quite different. Right? This is a mouse uh, that might be interested in preying upon this cricket. So mice hunt crickets. And it has to make a decision about whether to, to jump up and prey upon the cricket. Or maybe it's not hungry enough to justify that big motor act. Maybe it'll, it'll uh, give the cricket a pass. Um, rather different from what we study in the laboratory. And there are, of course, trade-offs between studying very ethological decisions and studying more rarefied laboratory paradigms. And in recent years, people have started to wonder whether we might also incorporate more ethological paradigms uh, because they have certain advantages. So one thing that we've argued for in my lab is that we don't really want to think about decisions as being natural versus unnatural, but really to realize that there's a few different ways that we might think about decisions. And we decided to define a, a three-dimensional space um, to help think about decision-making in the laboratory and in an ethological paradigm and, and beyond. And those three axes are, are complexity, so uh, how, how complex is the stimulus um, response, um, uh, also, stimulus response compatibility. So, for example, if I told you, you know, when you hear me snap here, look in that direction, that's quite stimulus response compatible. It's pretty natural to orient to a sound. If I told you instead, okay, when I snap on the right, look, that, look the other direction, that's going to be a lot harder. It's, it's a sort of a it's stimulus response incompatibility. 
might be really important to study, right? Because there are many situations in what we want, to, in, in which what we want to do is exactly what we should not do, right? A, a seven-year-old sitting in class, it wants to listen to the kid next to it telling a joke, but what it should do is listen to the teacher. So sometimes our ability to, to overcome that dominant response is, is really what the brain should do. And so we, we do want to study those stimulus response incompatible situations as well. And then the final axis on this plot is the ethological validity of the stimulus versus response. Many of the decisions I told you about in the lab have a very abstract relationship between the stimulus and what the animal is supposed to do. But there are other kinds of paradigms where there's a much more natural relationship. And the one that I schematized here at the very top uh, is, uh, you can see there's a speaker with a bunch of little hearts coming out of it. That's meant to schematize um, uh, a mating call that an animal might experience. So just to give you an example of an ethological approach, um, there was a really nice stimulus that was recently developed um, by Marcus Meister's lab and has been studied by Andy Huberman, Tiago Branco, and others. And it's called a looming stimulus. So there's a black circle that appears above the mouse's head. And this naturally drives animals uh, to flee. And we've also, in my lab, been studying this in a multi-sensory context. And I'll show you what it looks like uh, when a mouse experiences this. So this is a, an overhead view of a mouse in a little arena. He's having a little snack in the middle. That's a yogurt drop. And you'll see what he does when the stimulus comes on. You can see he runs, uh, runs for cover. And I'll show you that one more time. So the presence of that looming stimulus is fearful for the mouse. Perhaps it's reminiscent of a hawk descending from above, and he naturally flees uh, when he sees that stimulus. And we call this ethologically valid in the sense that we don't have to train the mouse to do this. It's something that the mouse just does naturally, presumably as an escape response. So I've told you a lot about what's happening in the field now. Uh, and finally, uh, before I wrap up, I'll, I'll give some hints about where I think the field is going. So here are our four schematic illustrations of changes in the field. Um, this first one shows a, a collection of neurons in the brain. These are pyramidal neurons, which are common uh, in the cortex and are kind of a unique shape that neurons have. And some of them are colored to uh, schematize the fact that now we can target specific cell types which, with much more precision than we used to be able to. We can target inhibitory neurons, like I mentioned a moment ago, and also neurons that project to a particular place. So if I'm recording an area A, I might be really interested in what the neurons do if they happen to be among that subset that project to area B. And now we have tools to do that. The second new direction for the field is what I mentioned a moment ago, where people are starting to consider using some more ethologically valid stimuli. And there's a trade-off here, because these stimuli are sometimes more difficult to parameterize and harder to interpret, but they do allow us to tap in to the sorts of decisions that the animals really evolved to make. So kind of weighing that, uh, considering that trade-off and weighing that is, is uh, I think, something a lot of investigators are doing. Um, third, we have a lot of new analyses um, for analyzing neural activity inspired by machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, it used to be in the old days, we'd measure, you know, 100 neurons and average them all together. Now it's a totally different world. Now we measure 600 neurons every day, and we use complicated um, classifiers uh, to, for example, see whether we can distinguish population activity in an advance of one decision versus another decision. And finally, um, we've started to get much better at a field at um, having automated ways to characterize what animals are doing. So this schematic uh, is meant to highlight an advance uh, in machine learning by Mackenzie Mathis and her colleagues, where the, um, act, the movements of a paw can be tracked with great precision. And there are many other efforts to do that as well, um, to characterize movements in an automated way so that we can either track them or more deeply understand them, such as the work of, of Bob Data, who's argued that there might be a behavioral grammar that could be useful in understanding movements and neural activity. So finally, um, a few parting thoughts. Uh, so humans and animals sometimes use information quite cleverly, like when they do statistically optimal Q combination, but nonetheless they occasionally lapse. But maybe I've convinced you that actually even these lapses are in a way the optimal thing to do because it allows animals to balance the exploration-exploitation trade-off. Uh, next, that decision-making is a brain-wide process that could be sensitive to disruption of many areas and circuits. So we need to understand how incoming sensory signals lead to action and how that goes wrong in a number of clinical situations. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>